Today's Day Live, the Sunday talk show, where we discuss all things political, bringing you the top stories locally, nationally, and from around the world. I'm Ruben Abati, and This Day Live begins now. Coming up in the next hour, rising cases of sexual violence and exploitation in Nigeria. The systemic failure in containing this menace against women, girls, and even underage boys. What measures need to be taken to end this scourge? The crisis rocking Nigeria's ruling party, the All Progressive Congress, reaches a crescendo. President Mohamed Obuari steps in to pull the party from the brink. Former APC National Chairman Adam Sushomole bows out, while former Lagos State Governor Paula Ahmed Chinubu admits the party was headed in the wrong direction. And more than 42,000 new COVID-19 cases reported in the United States. In India, the number of reported cases exceeds 500,000, while here in Nigeria, the spread of the novel coronavirus touches a new milestone. Welcome back. It's still this alive, the Sunday talk show. Despite the growing outcry against the rising incidents of rape and sexual assault against women and girls in Nigeria and even boys, there seems to be no end in sight to this in inhumane act of violence. Earlier in the month, there was outrage following the murder of a 22-year-old university student who was studying for her exams in the southern city of Benin. According to reports, Uavera Omozua, also known as Uwa, was brutally raped and bludgeoned to death. In many states in the northern part of the country, the situation is more dire as sexual violence is not just limited to women and girls, but is visited on underage boys who have to live with the trauma of rape carried out by bandits and criminal militant groups that have unleashed a reign of terror on the region. Many Nigerians blame the rising scourge of sexual violence on a legal system, they say, makes it hard to convict suspected rapists and shifts the blame on the victims when they are assaulted. According to reports, the Nigerian police have recorded 717 cases of rape between January and May this year. The Inspector General of Police, who met with President Muhammad Buhari, noted that 799 suspects have so far been arrested, while 631 cases have been conclusively investigated and charged to court. He further noted that 52 cases are still being investigated. The police chief went on to call on Nigerians to join in efforts to tackle rape and other forms of sexual violence by ensuring that cases are promptly reported and cooperating also with the police to apprehend the suspect. Here to discuss the growing menace of sexual abuse and rape in Nigeria and how to rehabilitate, reintegrate, and get justice for these victims are Asia Ahmed El Rufai, a lawyer and a forensic psychologist, and Josephine Efa Chukuma, a leading activist on gender based violence and women's human rights in Nigeria. Josephine, a former journalist, is also the founder and executive director of the non-governmental organization Project Alert on Violence Against Women. Welcome to the show, Asia and Justin. Good to have you on This Day Live, the Sunday talk show. Thank you, Reuben. Thank you. Yeah, you're Good welcome. Good to be here. Well, very quickly, Thank I you. mean, the question is to both of you, but I'll start with you, uh, Asia. Uh, since about 2008, we have had uh, lawmakers in Nigeria uh, talking about reviewing the uh, relevant laws on rape uh, to make it uh, harder for people to commit that particular crime. But here we are, so many years later, and we don't seem to have made any progress. 
the same old laws remain in place. What is it that you think is making it difficult for the Nigerian leadership uh, to take the front stage and to do the needful? Um, well, uh, I think um, a few things. Uh, one is culture. Uh, and another thing is uh, the fact that uh, the reporting on rape issues until very recently have been very quiet. People don't really talk about it because of fear of stigmatization. Uh, secondly, uh, culturally, people feel that uh, when you talk about uh, rape, you are indicting a whole culture or you are indicting a whole community or you are indicting a whole uh, uh, patriarchy. Because when we look at rape, we look at it from the aspect of women mostly, not knowing that actually even boys and men, young men, are actually also victims of this uh, heinous uh, attack. So generally, we have not spoken enough or we have not uh, done enough to make people understand the effect and the menace that uh, these issues are causing. And that is why we are seeing a rise in it. Uh, fortunately, some of the states have taken steps to make uh, changes in the laws. It is not true that since 2008, laws have not been changed. Yes, uh, for instance, in Kaduna State, the, there is the penal code which has been reviewed to make uh, rape a uh, life sentence. And um, we also have the Child Rights Act, which has been domesticated, which also makes it a life imprisonment for any rapist of a minor. Uh, we also have the Violence Against People, uh, which also makes it you know, a life imprisonment for people that have committed these offenses. So yes, there are pockets of uh, states here and there that have made efforts in order to change the narrative, to change the way that rape is being looked at. Uh, but it is not enough. It has to be holistic. It must be across the, uh, the country. Because if one state is doing it, what normally we see in our work is that uh, somebody will commit rape, he will be granted rape, he will move to another state. And because we do not have things like registers, we do not have uh, you know, means of identifying these people, they can easily blend back and continue what they're doing. Well, let me come to you, uh, Josephine. Uh, Josephine Efa Chukuma, you have been uh, uh, in this uh, area of uh, civic engagement for about 24 years. Uh, do you feel tired campaigning against violence, against uh, women, against the individual in society? And why do you think that rape remains a big problem? Thank you very much, uh, Raven. Um, I'm not only tired, I'm angry. I'm actually more angry than tired. I'm angry that all these years, some of us have spent over two decades, almost three decades doing this. And what is still keeping us at this level, if I must put it just two words, three words, is lack of the political will. We need to walk the talk. A lot of times we just keep talking and talking, you know, lip service from political officers, from government agencies, you know, we are very passionate, we have daughters like you, we have wives at home, you know, all those things we keep hearing. Some of us are tired of hearing that. It's time to walk the talk. We should put our money where our heart is. Money should be put into fighting sexual and gender-based violence in Nigeria. Talking about laws, laws have never been the problem. Nigeria is so good with, with enacting laws. We have laws. The Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act, yes, all the states have not domesticated them yet, but at least about 12 or 13 states at the last count have done that. But beyond doing that, that's step one. What next? You know, with the state of emergency that the governors at the governor's forum, the virtual meeting they had three or four weeks ago, they stood up from that meeting saying, agree that a state of emergency on this thing needs to be uh, put in place, announced in the country. That means action, starting from ground zero. And all states, as we are talking, all states have no reason 
no reason what at all. And when I talk of states, I mean the state government, I mean the state ministries of women affairs. They are the ministries that have been, that I mean, have the duty, the responsibility to take action on issues concerning women. The legislative arm of government, they should domesticate this beautiful piece of uh, legislation, the back act, so that it becomes law in all states. That is step one. Then after that, they should make funds available. Government should make funds available. State governments. I'm tired of saying, even though know, people say no money, no money. But there's always money for corruption and corrupt practices. I'm going to say it the way it is. There's always money for corruption and corrupt practices. Let us put money into fighting this scourge. We are dealing with an epidemic that is threatening each and every one of us. You know, you may say, I may what's my business, but may God help you with your daughter. You can play around with your wife. You can play around with your, uh, 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 with your girlfriend, but God help you and God help me with your daughter, my daughter, sister, you know, and all of that, and mother. So we need to, it's all about walking the talk. Political will, funding, 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 government making funds available, you know, for practical support services to set up sexual and assault referral centers in all states of the federation. For Ministry of Women Affairs in the states to set up shelters. NGOs are tired. We are tired of being the ones responding, um, uh, Ruben. Whatever progress has been made in this area today in Nigeria is the effort. 80% of NGOs, 80% is the effort of NGOs with just about 20% from government. We must be talking to ourselves. So that is what is going on here. Mm. Well, Asia Ahmed Rufai, Rufa, let me come back to you. Uh, you just had Josephine, uh, Ifa Chukuma, saying that laws are not the problem. Uh, what we need is funding, support, and then the political way. But as a lawyer yourself, uh, will you agree with the point she made initially that laws are not the problem? You have uh, cited the example of Kaduna State, where something has been done, and you cited all of that. But if you look at the laws, the relevant laws, starting with the criminal code, section 354, the definition of rape in section 357, the Child Rights Act, which has only been ratified by only about 23 states, and then the uh, Violence Against Persons uh, uh, Protection Act, which has only been ratified by about 12 states. Do you agree that laws are not the problem, or we still need to do something about the legal framework with regard to rape, evidence, the uh, burden of proof, and all of that? Well, uh, the laws need to be strengthened, really, uh, in the sense that um, if you look at it um, critically, when somebody in the criminal code, for instance, the rape uh, uh, penalty for rape is uh, 14 years max. Now, people are eligible to come out in three, four, five years. So when you have a law that gives a penalty that people, and some of them are even, they, they even have an option of a fine, people just, you know, take, take advantage of that and pay off whatever fine it is and move. So yes, uh, the laws may not necessarily be the only problem, but they are a problem in the sense that when people, when we don't do the right thing, when we don't make it, you know, a harsher, when we don't put harsher penalty for certain things, people don't learn from it. And that is why recently we've had calls from both NGO and uh, women generally saying that the penalty should be up updated to be, you know, uh, castration and death penalty. Now, this is on the one aspect. On the second aspect, we also have the issue of implementation. We may have the laws, but in terms of implementation, that is where we have a problem. I'll give you still an example of Kaduna State. We have cases, we take them to the, to the uh, police station. You have to take a perpetrator or a, a, a person alleged to have committed the crime to the court within 48 hours. 48 hours is not sufficient for them to conclude their investigations. So most of the time you find that even where 
our own, in our own case, uh, rape is a capital offense, and ordinarily it should not be a bailable offense. They are given rape. Uh, they are given bail, and when they are given bail, they disappear. Nobody. There is no monitoring of how you know you can track them and things like that. So again, this is uh, you know uh, one of the ways that uh, we are lacking in terms of you know uh, administration of the even the laws. You have the laws; they are there. They may be you. You may be able to uh, to to use them, but you don't have a way to ensure that they are being used. That is one. Secondly, again, you have the issue of uh, conflict of interest, in the sense that the police are the ones that are supposed to do the investigation, but it is the Ministry of Justice that is supposed to prosecute, and then you have the Women Affairs that is supposed to monitor. Now, this if this three organs are not organized and they are not uh, coordinated, you find that you have a lot of problems. So yes, I agree with Josephine to a very large extent that the laws are not our problems, but we are not walking the talk like she said, because we are not putting our mouth where our, our, our food is. We are not putting, we are not making enough provisions to ensure that investigations are carried out in time, we're, we don't have uh, forensics to, 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 to make sure that we preserve evidence. Uh, we don't have special courts to prosecute on time. So there is delay. So when there is delay, you know, we said the lawyers, will, as lawyers, we would normally say uh, 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 delay. Justice delayed is justice denied. Just, uh, delay in justice, uh, justice delayed is justice denied. So, yes, I do agree with her to a very large extent. Well, uh, Josephine, I would like you to help us address the issue of stigmatization, which seems to be a major issue with regard to uh, rape. Uh, what do you expect? What do you think families should do? Because you know our culture, it puts a special restraint on persons. Uh, nobody wants to uh, hear that, uh, oh, the daughter had been raped because of a future suitors. How do we move forward on that front? Uh Thank you very much, Reuben. I think the commodification of um, women, you know, the, 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 the scene of, of women as, as commodities, I mean, just needs to stop. A woman's life is not about, it's not about what, you know, uh, uh, what society thinks or what people should think or what people see of her. We should understand what this issue of blaming and shaming is not far from the old issue of who all support services available to victims and or survivors. Because if the support systems are in place, in terms of response from day one, in terms of care, counseling, in terms of medical access, in terms of access to the criminal justice system, where you go to the police station and you are victimized again, you know what in criminology is called secondary victimization, you know, because the primary victimization is the rape itself. And then the second victimization is a blame and a shame. If all of these are not there, why would I mean, if I'm a victim of crime, of course I want justice, of course I want help. But why would I come out and tell you uh, this is where I was wounded when I know you have nothing to offer me? You can't do it other than just tell me what were you doing there? You know, at the police station, um, I can bring him uh, um, for, for, for recharge card for a phone call for transportation that's why you hear people say i leave it to god when they say leave it to god it's not because they don't want justice it's because they are frustrated and they are tired you know justice goes to the highest leader in nigeria yes i'll build on what my sister said the laws are beautiful the laws that are needed they are the first but the laws cannot, cannot stand up and work for themselves we have to work these laws we have to work these laws you know, and then so when these laws are there, and then systems are not put in place. And what do I mean by this? And I always come back to the issue of funding. I will always come back because if the police, if the police are not, come on, I mean, let me even say it on air here. How much is the police? The police have no budget for investigation. They have no budget for investigations. So justice goes to the highest bidder. If I'm a victim of crime now and I go to the police station, the best the DPO will do for me is call one inspector or one uh, corporal there and say, follow Mrs. Chukuma. She said she has just been attacked. Madam, we are sorry. Eh? Just follow him. And I'll go there. He takes my statement. 
After that, the inspector will say, Madam, did you come with a car? No, I didn't come with a car. Okay, transport now. You won't enter bus with you. You have to hire a car. You know? And then, okay, there's no paper to write. Madam, we need to go and do photocopy outside. We must fix government. We must fix government. We must track this budget. Where are all this money is going to? Why come there are no monies for sexual and gender-based violence? For crimes? Then we tell people, oh, they are, uh, people are not reporting, uh, victims are not talking, uh, parents are ashamed. Why won't I be ashamed? Why won't I be ashamed if I speak out about my victimization and nothing happens? Instead of that, you are blaming me, you are shaming me, you are making me bring more money. Spend more money. And then we say the laws are there. The laws are just there on paper. Human beings have to work them. Human beings have to translate them. You know? Resources must be made available. Resources, not just money, but also training, capacity building. Across board, the police one, the Ministry of Women, the social welfare. The social welfare is another place we have a lot of problems. People there are just civil servants, just working. They are not passionate. We need people who are passionate in these ministries. We need the commissioners, if they don't know what is going on, they should be humble enough to want to listen to some of us and learn. We should, we should cut this politicizing uh, women's issues, politicizing sexual and gender-based violence, wanting to be politically correct. Oh, we are doing this. Oh, we are doing that. Meanwhile, nothing is being done. That is what is going on. And that is why victims, that's why families will always want to, you know, and I don't blame them. If you are not going to help me with my problem, you may as well just leave me alone. Leave me, let me just, you know, sit there and just, God help me you know, with whatever I want to do. So that is what we need to address. That is what we need to fix. We need to fix what is going on, the attitude. There is a huge tolerance level. And how come when we're talking about, you know, the, of course we have the Sexual Offenders Register. It was launched by NAPTIP last year. I am waiting to see the name of the big men on that register. I am waiting to see. Impunity is reigning. Yeah, look at from from uh, from the bench to uh, Pastor Koza. You know, once it is a big man, you will see trouble. You see impunity. Running to IGP, getting IGP's uh, IRT team to come and be the one to go after the the uh, the, the, the the survivor. But point, when it is a point, poor man, when it is point a, well made. a man, point well made, you know? But uh, in the few minutes that we have left, just about four minutes, I would like you and Asia to talk about. What you have been doing, I mean, you've given a picture of uh, what is going on uh, with regard to rape in Nigeria. But Asia, let me start with you. Uh, you've been uh, engaged in this area, trying to make sure that gender-based violence uh, is addressed. Could you share with us some of the things you've been doing? And uh, Justin, I'll come back to you uh, within the next, in the next two minutes. Um, yes, uh, my law firm actually does give uh, legal aid to uh, survivors, we ensure that uh, we prosecute and uh, we follow up cases. Uh, on the other hand, also I have uh, I'm, I'm a member of uh, an NGO called the Mama Marshall Foundation, where we have actually a referral center for supporting uh, uh, victims or survivors, you know, to have psychological support. And um, we are also working with some of the state governments in the north. Uh, specifically, I'm working with the Zamfara state government. I'm working with uh, uh, Kaduna state government. I'm working with uh, Kano state government in order to make sure that uh, what we are trying to do is to see that uh, a dedicated commission is set up in each of these states that will address the issue of uh, gender-based violence and uh, sexual violence against both male and females so that we will have dedicated lawyers that will do these investigations as against waiting you know, for uh, the Ministry of Justice to provide uh, lawyers that will go and take. We have people that will be dedicated to following up all of, uh, on, on, on all of these cases. And uh, we do collaborate, again, with a lot of NGOs. Like she said, most of the time, 90% of the work is being done by the NGOs. So uh, basically, it's collaboration work. We are also doing research. Uh, Her Excellency, the wife of the governor of Niger State and myself, have just initiated you know, uh, a research on survivors 
you know, a, a retrospective research to show the effect of rape in, on, on, on survivors so that we don't just continue talking and people don't actually see. We keep saying that there are backlashes on survivors, but people don't see the figures. So we want to do that to ensure that uh, we are also doing uh, scientific research to prove that these things are going with a view to ensuring or insisting or you know, trying to make the government to do the right thing by funding some of these activities that are supposed to be done to curtail these manners. Thank you. Well, quickly, uh, Josephine, I know you've been involved in this for more than two decades. Would you like to tell us a little about uh, your NGO uh, project against uh, uh, gender-based violence? Thank you very much, Reuben. Um, the name of the organization I run is Projects a lot on Violence Against Women. The name speaks for itself. Um, we honestly pride ourselves as uh, being the, uh, uh, the forerunners in, um, on this issue. When we started in January 1999, we worked very well through very few organizations we were doing, with the exception of organizations like maybe Baoba, uh, CRP, and a couple of people. We are the first to really focus on this. And uh, we started, I mean, because of the, uh, the time we started, we had to do a lot of um, heavy lifting at that time. So we took up three programs, uh, you know, that programs that right now an organization can even pick one of it and do. You know, we do research and documentation because it's very important we document, you know, all these things. It's not enough to just keep talking. Documentation helps. And it's actually the documentations we did in the early years of Project Ola that helped, um, that we use for legislative advocacy that helped in the laws that we have gotten, you know, on domestic violence laws and all, the, and all of that. We also set up the first shelter for abused women in Nigeria, known as um, Sophia's Place, because practical support services is very dear to, to us and especially to me because it's not enough to be advocating and be advocating. Advocacy is the easiest thing to do. You talk on television, you talk on radio, but then the, the survivors themselves, what do you do to help them? So we have our counseling department, we have legal aid, and then the shelter, Sophia's, you know, we have temporary shelter, <clears throat> women. Well, unfortunately, that's all we can take on this segment of the program. I would like to thank you, Asia Ahmed. El Rufai and Josephine Efa Chukuma for sharing your insights with us. Thank you very much indeed. It's time now for a break here on This Day Live, this Sunday talk show. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back to This Day Live, this Sunday talk show here on the Arise News Channel. Joining me now in the studio are Professor Bola Akintenrua, Director General, Bolitak Center for International Diplomacy and Strategic Studies. And Yemi Adamolepun, Executive Director, Enough is Enough. Well, Yemi and Prof, you both listened to um, Asia Ahmed El Rufai and uh, Josephine Fachukuma discussing a very topical subject, rape. There seems to have been an increase in uh, cases of rape in Nigeria, you know given the introduction that I gave. But, Yemi, let me start with you. Does this uh, spike in rape cases, does it have anything to do with COVID-19, the lockdown, or this is a problem that we've not been uh, focusing upon previously that is now in the public domain because it is better reported? I'll say both. Um, we'll start with COVID-19, and it's global. I mean, from WHO to the UN, have reported cases around the globe um, for different reasons. Um, women are, are at home. Um, men are idle, if I want to use that word, because ultimately rape is about power. Um, and so the shutdown in economy and shutdown in movement has exasperated cases of domestic violence and, um, and rape. So COVID-19 has, has one part to play. But I think also more fundamentally, um, media has, has sort of been disaggregated. So people can report things on, on social media. People can use their cameras to take pictures. Um, voice has been given to women in sort of telling their stories and telling their experiences because there are now more spaces where you can go and uh, people will listen to you and people will believe you. Definitely not enough, but there are, uh, there are more spaces where women can go and be believed. And um, as we've seen, for example, in the recent case with um, Sheyi and, and uh, Dibanj and the allegations, a lot of support for Sheyi on social media. Sheyi Yes. 
um, a lot of support for her on social media, even though there are allegations at this moment, but also on the back of that, Debange's reaction and the use of the police, a lot of condemnation in that regard that, yeah, if she, if she is accusing you falsely, that's fine. Deal with that in, a, in the court of law. You have lawyers. But then do not abuse the instruments of power to intimidate her and, and put fear in her so she retracts her story. So I think that as well, and social media really, literally, all of that has happened in real time. You don't have to wait to get a paper the following morning to read what happened. All of these things are happening in real time. So yeah, definitely. Well, Prof, your thoughts uh, on the submissions made by Asia Ahmed El Rufai and uh, Josine Fachukuma. They said both of them agree, for example, that this is not just about reforming the law, yeah. that a lot more needs to be done, there must be funding, there must be political will, and then, of course, we need to destigmatize and then reform the entire justice administration system. Your thoughts? I think we should, first of all, commend the efforts of both Asia and Josephine. They have done very well. They have tried to conscientize, you know, the general public on the challenges. But let us uh, look at the uh, issues they have raised. For instance, Josephine um, raised the issue of um, women being taken as uh, commodities, that this one should stop. I do not think that uh, the matter is um, considering women, girls as commodities, and you can do whatever you want. Commodities are uh, far from the um, argument. For instance, if you look at um, the current report, uh, a 100-level um, female student in the uh, Bauchi State University, mm. all right, um, she's been um, kidnapped, all right, but uh, the kidnappers have told us that, look, the kidnapping is not for the purposes of ransom, that it is the virginity of the girl they wanted. You now want to rape her for the purposes of virginity. In other words, now, you, you rape for purposes of uh, rituals. Now, rituals, you want to have money. You have money, you are wealthy, you now use that one to oppress, you give money to have chieftaincy title, and then in the society, the, the, the source of your wealth, all right, is from all this um, ritual killing. That one, you don't talk about uh, commodity. The second point, I remember, I think it was on June 9, one Ruben Abati wrote on um, the, the <laughs> four categories. Could it be the same Ruben Abati that is sitting here? Yes, of course. <laughs> now, now, you see, this uh, Ruben Abati differentiated between four categories of pandemics. And the fourth pandemic is this issue of uh, rape. And now he gave um, a comprehensive analysis of the dimensions and the challenges. This issue of political will, lack of political will, was raised there. So in this case, I will agree with um, the proponents of a uh, lack of a uh, political will as a major challenge. But the, you see, the, the problem is more critical than that. When uh, a man rapes a man, it's no longer a man versus woman. All right? You have a girl to girl, boy to boy, and uh, you rightly raise this fundamental problem in that particular article, all right, around the, the, the middle paragraphs of the article. Now, when you look at this type of situation, I think what is fundamentally wrong in Nigeria now, when we talk about increase in number of rapes, we should also be talking about the increasing social distancing between Nigerians and God. Now, <laughs> when, for instance... Social distancing between Nigerians and, and God. God. And God, yes. <laughs> How? Now, for instance, <clears throat> why is it that uh, we're having an increase in, um, in the number of rapes? It is simply because we are moving far, far, far away from God. Mm. And in this case, people don't have the fear of God. The issue now is that... Um, Godliness is no longer there. If you have godliness in your mind, how will a father, for instance, a father, be sleeping, be raping his own children? Mm -hmm. Your own children. And we have is had a, many cases like that. There are many. And they've justified it. Of course. They will say, oh, my wife left me, so I turned to the daughters. 
So you, you, know. you, you describe that person as mad. I think you said it's the, it, it, it's the worst in all there. I think people should just read that particular article to have a fundamental understanding of the challenge. Well, thank you, Prof. What we've done so far today is to focus on the major issue of rape and the crisis that Nigeria faces with regard to the rape pandemic and the emerging Me Too movement in Nigeria with more women speaking up uh, with even boys uh, who have been abused speaking up. The subject will continue to focus upon, but let's look at another subject. With the avalanche of uh, court cases and defections, the crisis rocking Nigeria's ruling party, the All Progressive Congress, APC, has reached a boiling point. Just last week, President Mohamed Buhari was forced to nip the crisis in the board when he lent support to the court-recognized acting national chairman of the party, Victor Giadom to convene a meeting of the National Executive Committee of the party, NEC. At the meeting, far-reaching decisions were taken, ranging from the dissolution of the National Working Committee of the APC to the inauguration of a caretaker committee to convene an extraordinary convention of the party six months from now. After the initial shock of the decisions taken by the National Executive Committee the APC former national chairman, Adam Sushomole, who had been ousted a week earlier following a ruling by the Court of Appeal, said he had accepted the decision in good faith. Coming on the heels of Sushomole's statement was another one made by former Lagos State Governor and national leader of the ruling party, Bola Ahmed Tinubu, who acknowledged that the crisis was self-inflicted. However, he expressed satisfaction that the president had stepped in to stem the slide and dismiss speculations linking the conflict that rocked the party to his purported bid for the presidency in 2023. Prof, I'll start with you on this. Um, the whole week, we've all been following the crisis in the ruling party in Nigeria, the All Progressives uh, Congress. Uh, some people say, well, the president did well by stepping in and seizing control or, you know, checking the slide. But some other people within the party say what the president did was illegal. One, the party was held in the uh, council chambers of the, uh, uh, of the uh, presidency. Two, uh, the uh, new uh, chairman, as it were, the interim chairman, was sworn in by the attorney general of the uh, federation. Uh, federation. Three, um, party members insist that... Uh, uh, there was no seven-day notice that was required by the constitution of the party. Four, they argue that the uh, Attorney General of the Federation, swearing in um, uh, Malam uh, Maibune, uh, the governor of uh, Yobe State, as the new uh, interim chairman, uh, was not empowered to do so under Article 17, Subsection 4 of the uh, party constitution. What do you expect? What's your assessment? You gave me four fundamental reasons <laughs> as to why the president did not do well. And you are still asking me now to make a comment. No, I'm just Victor, reporting. I'm just reporting. Victor Waifo. I love Victor Waifo because he is preaching to the world to say, look, do what I say, but not what I do as Victor Waifo. Now, on the one hand, you have uh, the, the, the regulation, the constitution of the uh, APC, the ruling party in place, which clearly states that um, whoever is going to swear in an uh, elected um, you know, leader of uh, the party, the prescriptions, the modalities, the manner, well clearly stated. Now, Mr. President, our president, President Muhammad Buhari, who is preaching the ethos of um, democracy. Who is preaching uh, rule of law? All right? Is the same person now not going along, mm. you know, the regulations. So you cannot be preaching what you do not believe in. That's the first point. The second point there is that, look, those who are complaining about the attorney general, attorney general, you are the attorney general of the federation. Federation of Nigeria, Federal Republic of Nigeria. So when do you now 
uh, dissociate yourself from the office of the Attorney General of the Federation to now swearing in uh, a member of your political party. That is bastardization of the, of the rule of law. And this is why Nigeria has not always been in problem, but has the potential to remain permanently in this vicious circle. Because we consciously open our eyes all right, to do wrong things. While we are now begging God to come and help us. <laughs> God can never be ready okay, to open the pages in his, in his own register to see where Nigeria's problem is and then attend to it. <laughs> we consciously engage in ungodly acts in this country. And then we will be going to church. We say we are fasting. And they will be killing themselves to say, look, uh, no lockdown. Look, let's go and pray to God. God cannot listen to Nigeria in this type of situation. Unless we stop, you know, these uh, acts of uh, deliberate iniquities. We will never have any way forward. My position there is that those who said uh, Mr. President didn't do well, I think I subscribe to that particular um, school of thought. We need, you do not have to engage quote and unquote. I always use this word, panel beating. Mm -hmm. When you have a dented vehicle, the, in, in Europe, they will normally remove that uh, spoiled part. But here in Nigeria, uh, we must take manage. a heavy camera. Yes, we are always managing and managing and managing. But the problem is still there. Yeah. Yeah, we can let, continue let, like let me this. take your thoughts on this. I mean, there are winners and losers involved. Mm -hmm. I think it was this day that reported that, you know, there have been winners, there have been losers within the uh, party. Mm -hmm. And that, in fact, there are some people say internally displaced persons now <laughs> in the APC. <laughs> Some people say Ashiva Jubala Ahmed Tinubu and Adam Adam Shomala have become internally displaced. Mm -hmm. But what is the larger implication for Nigerian politics and the political party system? I think for me fundamentally it's I'm actually quite happy to see this happening within the APC because the the sort of um, <laughs> no it's true because the sort of toga of we're different of change, of sort of different yeah. types of politics, integrity that um, uh, Mr. President has, has put on and the party has put on, is raveling before our eyes. And I'll point to two things. One of the things that's always been said about um, President Buhari is that he doesn't get involved in things. As my friends like to say, that he, he would unlook everything that has to do with the party. But I think for me, this clearly shows a man that chose to get involved because he wanted to. So the idea that he's not, he doesn't disturb his mind with these pedestrian things, I think for me, the fact that this put that clearly at rest, so nobody can come and say that again, that he doesn't get involved. Yes, President Obasanjo was the master of interference, he interfered in everything when it came to PDP as a political party. But I well, think some people will say it was a handsome president. Whichever way, I've said it the way I want to. When we say actively it's a, engaged, at <laughs> actively all times. engaged at all times, handsome, actively engaged. whichever idea is need. But the fact that <clears throat> President Buhari has always kept that very aloof, I don't know, I don't know what's happening, in, be, be, be it state politics or federal at the federal level, I think for me, watching him clearly play. A, a role and a hand, not just in his decision, but also then using the instruments and the, the paraphernalia of the state to entrench that in the, using the executive chambers. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, I want to end with um, what Simon Kolawoli put here regarding to the Attorney General of the, of the Federation. He says, according to the APC Constitution, anybody appointed as an officer of the party shall subscribe to the oath of office as provided in Schedule 2 to this constitution before an appropriate principal officer of the party as may be approved by the National Working Committee. That's Article 29. Thank Article you very much. Article 29 of the APC constitution. As far as I know, the Attorney General Malami is not a principal officer of the APC. He's a principal officer of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. So if the APC, in front of the president of the country, allows the attorney general of the country to violate their own constitution exactly. and sway in an officer, I mean, it doesn't get any more comic and tragic than that. In the chambers of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, in front of the president, the vice president, and other governors. And we're watching this, and everybody thinks it's okay. So if this is the way we want to play this game, let's continue. Chibi, um, what's it called? Obaseke has defected to PDP. Mm -hmm. The deputy governor in Ondo, Ondo has an APC governor and a PDP <laughs> deputy governor, which, funny enough, the constitution actually allows him to, because there's no provision for him to vacate the office for 
um, defecting parties. But I think if we're paying attention as a country and as a people at the, about the mockery, I mean, and I said it last week when it came to um, Ajimobi, uh, may his soul rest in peace, how his name was being bandied around of a man who who couldn't speak for himself. And then you take see this over the course of the week. So let's continue to watch as we play games with a country and we're watching so-called political leaders act like children. So you are joining the Sidon Look group. Oh, we're not Sidon Look. One uh, minister <laughs> said the other day that he too is uh, adopting the no, Sidon Look posture. No, it's actually, thank you. I, and I don't mean Sidon Look in that sense. I mean Sidon Look, I mean looking, as in let's also observe to influence action. Okay. Because if we don't learn anything for when our political office holders in public glare, they didn't do this in a closed door meeting. In the federal executive chambers, president, vice president, watches an officer of the federal republic violating a party's constitution, swearing another person, and everybody thinks this you is You know wrong. that what you are saying that uh, Abuba oh. Kamalami is is attorney general of the federation. Not Attorney General of the APC. And let me even use Samakola Wale's words. Malami has been ridiculing the office of the Attorney General since 2015. Preposterous. Anyway, let's move on. Let's take one more topic before we wrap it up today. As of late Saturday afternoon, more than 42,000 new COVID-19 cases have been reported in the United States of America. The second day in a row that new cases had risen about 40,000 in the country. In India, the story was just as grim as the number of reported cases rose to more than 500,000. Delhi's chief minister said a surge in infections had led to rising fatalities and shortage of hospital beds. On the African continent, COVID-19 cases and fatalities also grew exponentially, with the continent recording 371,611 confirmed cases and sadly, 9,485 deaths as of this morning. Here in Nigeria, the spread of the novel coronavirus disease touched a new milestone as the latest statistics provided by the Nigeria Center for Disease Control, NCDC, revealed that Nigeria now has 24,077 confirmed cases. On Saturday, the 27th of June, the NCDC confirmed 779 new cases with unfortunately four deaths recorded. This was the highest daily case recorded, having carried out a total daily test of 2,068 samples across the country. To date, 8,625 cases have been discharged, and 558 deaths have sadly been recorded in 35 states and the Federal Capital Territory in Nigeria. A total of 127,000 158 tests had been carried out as of June 27th, uh, compared to 125,090 tests a day earlier. Lagos remains the epicenter for the virus. The implication of all of this is that we are recording new spikes across the world. The United States remains uh, the number leader. one uh, in terms of uh, the several prevalence. You have Brazil, you have Russia, you have uh, the United Kingdom. You have the whole of Latin America uh, becoming the new epicenter. But here in uh, Nigeria, Lagos remains the epicenter. But some people have been saying perhaps the uh, government of Nigeria should impose a lockdown in some other states. Meanwhile, in your state, schools are meant to reopen tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You hear me? I come back to you. Well, it's, um, yeah, I think, okay, two things I I'd like to focus on. One I'll use Cross River again as, as an example, as I did last week. During the week, the University of Calabar issued a memo, basically stating... University of Calabar Teaching Hospital. Teaching Hospital, thank you, sorry. Issued a memo, basically stating that they were bypassing their own state government and they were going to be sending samples directly to the NCDC. Because for some odd reason, it seems like Governor Ayade thinks there's a medal to be won for being COVID-free. Because his insistence that <laughs> Cross River is COVID-free, I don't understand it. Anyway, University of Calabar Teaching Hospital, realizing that they have a problem, has decided because the way it's been managed, it's managed through the state's ministries of health. So if your Ministry of Health is insistent that either NCDC was to bring in positive samples or whatever it is, I think for me that speaks volumes. One, and, I'm, and I really commend the University of Calabar Teaching Hospital for deciding to put the citizens of Cross River. That's my former school. Ah, interesting. <laughs> yeah. So put the citizens of, of Calabar. Calabar. Put the citizens of Cross River ahead of a governor that, quite frankly, has been very reckless with their lives.
So I think that's one thing. A second bit that I think the, at the federal level that we're not getting quite right, and again, we've been making a call for this, that the uh, presidential task force needs to be expanded to include civil society and private sector to ensure that there's a, a, a robust um, sort of access to information to, to shape their, their decisions, is the fact that at the federal level, we're still not communicating effectively. I mean, I saw a, a pastor of a major church this afternoon calling the virus what he's calling an anti-church virus. And his premise is the fact that people are allowed to go to the market, but they're not, not allowed to come to church. And for me, that just shows either a fundamental lack of understanding, and I wonder if the federal government, for example, is reaching out to en engage someone like him, who is extremely influential over citizens, to understand why a market which is in an open space um, doesn't doesn't allow the virus to travel as far as a church which is within a closed space. So communication to speak to people's particular concerns and people's lack of understanding, I do not believe that the federal government NCDC is doing as well as, as they should. Well, Prof, let me come to you. I mean, some people are saying, look, should government impose the lockdown again, particularly in some parts of the country? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Because the numbers keep going, keeps going on. And police are rich, because people are, are traveling. Quickly, Prof, we are just too much. I think there is the need for what should be done rightly. Mm. Yemi mentioned Ayade. She should have told us that, look, it is the Donald Trump in Ayade <laughs> that is the question. <laughs> These are people who knew quite well, and they know quite well that we have this problem, but they pretend <laughs> that the problem is not there. The second point there is that, look, in, in Nigeria, we are talking about increase, increase, increase on daily basis. Mm. But we know quite well that it is consciously being spread. People are out. Mm. Nobody is respecting all this. Interstate, please. <laughs> you just go to Ojota mm. on the road. I went to Emeko yesterday to see the pastor of the Celestial Church of Christ. Prof. Yes. You violated the interstate I did travel not. lockdown. I have... I have a, a permit, pass yes, travel. I have a pass. Yes, Prof does not violate. From Arise News, I guess. No. Not only um, Arise News, you have a, this diplomatic COVID pass. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Diplomat. So, so, you see, in this case, the... Uh, Don't worry, you went to him, because you should go and self-isolate. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, there. But I, there was a lot I, of traffic. I, 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 take, doctor, but I your point. take all the necessary so precautions. Cute, uh, the point is that, that you saw. The, the leader of the Celestial Church of Christ told all members to say they should comply with government's uh, regulations, that he doesn't have the means to, to control all this. So you see, when some church leaders mm. are respecting the regulation, mm. and some others who believe in a holier-than-thou are creating problems, please, it's a question of order and counter-order amounting to disorder, yeah. and that's why we are in trouble in Nigeria. <laughs> Anyway, thank you very much, uh, Professor Akintero, and thank you, Yemi Adamolekun. Executive Director, enough is yes. enough. <laughs> You've been watching This Day Live, the Sunday talk show here on Arise News. I'm Ruben Abati. From my entire team here in Lagos, it's bye for now, and thank you very much for watching. We'll see you next Sunday. <laughs>